and welcome to another episode of the Hey Girl Podcast. We're your hosts, Bethany Needham and Laurie Casagrande. And each week, we get to share with you stories from women of all ages and stages of life who are following Jesus right where they're at. Our prayer is that each story encourages you to run your race in your place. In today's episode, we get to introduce you to Michelle Weston. I had the privilege of meeting Michelle on a road trip with my family at a burger joint, which we'll talk a little bit about later in the episode. But Michelle is so much fun. She's a mom, a wife. She's got three adorable children. But Laurie, now that you've heard her story, if you could think of a phrase to describe Michelle to our listeners, what would it be? Michelle described herself as a loud and louder, hard on her sleeve, multitasking mama. She is pretty awesome. So I'm excited to get into the story and have you learn more about Mrs. Weston and what makes her unique. So without further ado, here's our friend, Michelle Weston. Hey, everybody. (laughs) Yay! here. And we're over FaceTime, so we'll probably have that sound of both of us are totally doing the earbud thing. But I love that thanks to technology, I get to do interviews with people that there's probably not not a good chance that we would have been able to do this face to face anytime not. soon. Unless yeah. I really want to take a drive to where in you're in Rochester? Rochester, New York. Rochester, yeah. New York. Not to be confused with Rochester, New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That would be closer for me. <laughs> yes, yes, it would. <laughs> Rochester, New York. So I don't have a ton of history with you, but I always say, like, like to make the connection. How do I know you? And I met you when we were traveling back from Toronto. We had been on vacation, and my husband, of course, how many of my connections have come through my husband? Cause he, yeah, same, same here. <laughs> I know. I think he knows everyone is what I've, that's my conclusion. But he's like, Hey, I have this friend. We should totally meet for lunch. And I'm going to be totally honest. We had just finished vacation and I'm like, okay, babe, the only scenario that this is not going to be like kind of miserable for me is if these are super chill people that are not going to have like expectations that I'm going to be like on my game. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was in that like vacation fog. Right. For sure. (laughs) I've been on vacation, but I kind of need a nap fog. And you were perfect. The perfect people to to meet. I (laughs) knew when you wanted to meet at a burger joint, okay, this friendship, this could work out. Yes, for sure. (laughs) This girl will sit and eat a burger and fries. And an amazing milkshake. (laughs) Oh, it was amazing. So we got to meet, loved you. Your kids are adorable. Yeah, right back at you. (laughs) Oh, and we'll get a chance to talk about your kids, your family, but why don't we rewind the tape a little for those who have not gotten the pleasure of sharing a burger and fries with you (laughs) and tell our listeners a little bit about where you come from, who you are. I am the wife to Mike Weston, and he currently is the director of Children's Ministries at the church that we attend up here in Rochester, New York. I am a mom to three kids. I have Anna Lee, she's eight, John David, who's six, and Liam, who is three. And I'm currently home with him right now. (laughs) And uh, we're in the midst of potty training. (laughs) So that's fun. Uh, Always interesting. Um, So you're really risking it coming on this podcast. Things could be happening. Well, I put him in a (laughs) pull-up. And I stuck him with an iPad. (laughs) You are a very committed guest. I'm giving you bonus points for that. Thanks, thanks. So, I mean, that's that's who I am, like, right now in my everyday life. But I actually grew up in Massachusetts. I was born and raised in Worcester. That's where I thought I would live and die. (laughs) I just thought um, none of my family, well, my family has slowly weeded themselves to the south and things like that. For the most part, my family's always just been there. I never thought that I would be one to leave, especially the fact that my, like my mom and my stepdad and my step siblings still live there. So, and then I, when I met Mike, he's the one who like took me away. <laughs> he swept me, he swept he me kidnapped away. kidnapped you. He did. He did. I think my mom would agree that that's true. 
<laughs> so yeah. not a not a strong relationship then between <laughs> well yes we do but <laughs> when did you meet mike i can't even remember the year we've been married for almost 13 years Does that make it like 2003 something to that effect i was a teacher teaching four-year-olds at the time like a pre-k yeah and I, it was a Christian school, so, you know, it's like the pre-K all the way to high school. <laughs> it's like the whole game. Yes. And he was recruited to come and be the coach, like the PE teacher for all the grades and then the coach for soccer and basketball. He wasn't quite sure, like, if he wanted to actually work there right away because he wanted to come and check the place out. So I had met him when he first came up. We had some, like, we had a mutual friend who was, who was like, oh, like, he's coming. And, <laughs> and you know, I was single. I was graduated from college, and I didn't have anyone in my life at the time. And we were, you know, I don't, New England churches don't have a plethora of I was going to say, it's slim pickings. Men. Let's just call it what. Yes. <laughs> so when he arrived there, you know, I wasn't the only girl in on in the camp. <laughs> but I, I was just trying to play it cool if I was cute. I was trying to play it cool like, oh, like, I don't really like him, you know. And then again, like if you like my whole story is I. I was saved at nine, but I don't think I was really grounded in God's word. Like my mom, like she, she loves Jesus. She serves Jesus. She loves God with all her heart, but I don't feel like I ever really got grounded. So like when I went to college, like I knew I was supposed to like read my Bible, pray and tell people about Jesus, but that was it. Right. So I fell away. I didn't really make good choices in college. And so my senior year of college, I decided to rededicate my life. I was like, look, this is enough. Like I'm super depressed. I had a lot of suicidal thoughts. Things were just really yucky in my hmm. life. God grabbed my heart very, um, big way that, cause I need two by fours. <laughs> I'm I not, gotcha. I'm some people need a quiet little tap on the shoulder. Like God's like, excuse me, but you need to fix this. I need like someone to whack me upside the head and knock me on my back. So that's what he did with that. And I just realized I need God in my life. And so I rededicated my life. And so it sounds super corny, but I was like, no, like I'm going to love, I'm going to love God and I'm going to love him first. And I'm not going to seek my needs in a guy. And so when he came along, I'm like, yeah, he's great, but but I have Jesus. I know it sounds so corny. But Jesus is my boyfriend. <laughs> well, I didn't go that far, but, but definitely was like, no, like God is like, you know, he, I want to, I want to serve him first and foremost. Yeah. I, I, um, I kind of was like, well, if it's really meant to be, God will make it happen. So I kind of just kept pushing back, pushing back. But at the same time, I'm a girl <laughs> and I like boys, you know? So, um, when he came, we, you know, we had interacted, but then he was like leaving at the end of the weekend mm -hmm. and I never got his number. And I didn't know if he was going to like take the job. I come to find out we both like had liked each other. And I thought, oh my gosh, I may never see him again. <laughs> and I really like him. And I think I just blew my shot because um, he seemed like a pretty great guy. But then he ended up signing the contract and coming to teach at the school. I remember when I saw his car parked outside the school for the first time and I got like all these like butterflies. I'm like, oh no, he's Aww. here. <laughs> oh no, like he really, because that's the only way I knew. Like I didn't know that he had accepted the job until... So I saw the car, like, like literally the first day of like teachers coming back. And I was like, oh my gosh, she's here. So we met and it was a fast courtship. We were t helping out in youth group together at the time. And after we had gotten engaged, you know, the girls all want to hear the story. And I was like, do not follow my example. <laughs> like, I got, we got engaged quickly, but, but we knew it was God. And I, <laughs> this is not something you should follow. Don't follow my example. Do as I you say, know, not as I do. <laughs> I was like, we need to date a guy for a long time. <laughs> we met in September. We're engaged in December and we're married in July. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So you like new, new. Well, yeah. There, yeah. Do you want to hear that story? <laughs> uh, kind of. Yeah. So it was, it was pretty significant. Again, like I told you, like I wanted to make sure that the next person I was going to date in my life would be someone that I was going, that God wanted me to marry. So I was pretty rigid about that. Like I'm an all, I'm an all or nothing type of person. So when I'm all in, I'm all in. And I was like, 
I am committed to my relationship with God. And so even though we were dating and we had started to like each other and it seemed easy, like, you know, and they say, oh, you just know, like, it's so true. Like, I can't even explain that. Like, it was like I had known him my whole life, but I didn't know anything about him. And I knew I was falling in love with him. But then he revealed to me at like, I don't know, it was just some casual date at a burger joint <laughs> and I yes said, yes and I and he said like oh I you know he just you know we you share your dreams and what you want to do with your life and he's like I really feel like God wants me to plant a church in New England and I was like what 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 <laughs> because the reason is I like I said like I didn't live the the, the best life so I did not feel it, immediately my mind's like, I'm not qualified for that. <laughs> like, does, does he, like, does God even know me? Like, I am not, I am the last person on this list because I'm, I'm, I'm an, I'm extremely extroverted. I'm extremely loud. My stepfather always made a joke my whole life that I have two volumes and it's louder, louder. <laughs> I can, he's, I can never, I, I get shh all day, every day from my children. <laughs> I'm so loud. <laughs> I, I have no musical abilities. I can't carry a tune in a bucket. So you can't see me singing in front of like the church. I won't be playing an instrument. So I was like, my only gift is like my loudness. I don't know. So I just was like, I just thought, no, like I just wanted to be a teacher for the rest of my life. I, I can't see myself as, I don't know. I just felt like that position was like way more holy, way more, pure, way more righteous than like I would ever feel like I could attain. You know what I mean? So I just was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We need to put, we need to stop and we need to, we need to pray about this. Cause I was like, I, I love God and I, I put him first. And so I want to make sure that my heart doesn't get in the way of my head. Hmm. So I am also very emotionally driven. My empathy sometimes can get the best of me. Like I feel things so deeply. Um, I wear my heart in my sleeve. And so I, in order to protect myself, sometimes I have to go almost overboard on the logic. (laughs) And so I was like, we just need to pray about this. And, and we had decided to have like a cabinet of counselors in our lives. Like, so we had even asked our parents like previous to this, like if we need help with a relationship or things, can we come to you? And they were like, yeah, of course. Sure. Like what parent wouldn't want their kids to say, please give me all the advice that you could ever tell me, you know? So I just, we called up our parents and, and so just to know my husband a little bit, he's nothing like me. (laughs) So he's like my complete opposite. And so the whole time I'm like this, he's probably just quietly like smirking and nodding his head and just humoring me because he knows that, okay, she needs this, but I know, I know this is what it's supposed to be. But so he's like, okay, like we'll pray. Sure. (laughs) That's what you need to do to feel better. I'm like, no, no, it's not to feel better. It's what we need to do. I think, I don't know how long, I want to say it was about a week. We, I kind of didn't even really want to see him. I, it sounds so mean, but I really just wanted to get alone in my head and make sure that this is something Because for me, it felt serious because if I was going to date him and I was going to marry him someday, that would ultimately mean that I would, if he's playing a church, I'm there. And, and I I just wasn't sure if I was ready for that kind of commitment, (laughs) commitment to God. Like I felt like I wasn't just committing to him. I was committing my life in a really big way to God that I didn't feel prepared for. And so, um, And so I had written him this really mushy love letter because, again, I'm emotional. So I process best through through the written word, like through writing and through verbal processing. Like I need to get the words out of my head. That's being an extrovert. Like I can't internally process anything. (laughs) And so I wrote it all out. I was like, I don't know how God calls like a pastor's wife. I don't know if he like writes it in the sand. I don't know if he sends an angel and taps him on the shoulder. I don't know if he writes it in the clouds, like with like an airplane, like, you know, like you are to be a pastor's wife. (laughs) Like I, I didn't know. I said, I don't know what that looks like, but what I do know is that I love you with all my heart. And that 
I will go where you go. I will follow you. I will serve God with you. And I will fan like the flame that God puts in your heart. Like, I, I don't know how to, to do the things you want to do, but I know how to love. <laughs> I know how to love you. So I'm going to, I'm going to love you and, and support you and, and motivate you in, in the best way that I can for you. And, and just hope that the rest just falls into place. And so he said, when he got that letter, he says, I need to see you right now. And I was like, it was 10 o'clock at night. And again, like we're both single, we're both, you know, newly graduated from college. We were in youth group. So we were trying to flee all appearances of evil. And I know that sounds super, again, it sounds, makes me sound so, if you knew me really, like I'm not, I, I only do things if I know that they work (laughs) and it sounds super legalistic and I don't know, pious, but I just felt like, again, like I need to protect myself. And so we just, even though it was 10 o'clock at night and he had his own apartment and it wasn't a conversation that he wanted my mom to hear. Like we were like, we need to go again. We can go to Wendy's. Everything happens at burger plate and fast food places in my life. There's a theme. And so we went to Wendy's because it was like the only place open until like one o'clock at night. And so we got a soda. We sat down and he says, because I can't on the phone. He told me like, I can't tell you. He's like, can't just tell me on the phone. He's like, no, I need to show you. And I'm like, that's weird. So (laughs) he sits me down and he opens up the Bible to Ruth chapter one and verse 16 and 17. Now I know that Ruth is about a lot of people say, Oh, I hear there's two camps to that. Oh, like Ruth, it's a love story, you know? And then the other side, well, it's no, it's about a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law. It's not, it's, 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 you know, so I understand that there's two camps to the story, but I think that in, they actually can blend beautifully. So Mm. even knowing the truth of the passage and being able to read it in context, I still think can apply to a love life. Ruth, she's a Moabite. She left everything she knew to marry a man that she loved and he dies and her brother-in-laws die and her father-in-law dies. And Naomi, you know, you know, the context of the, the history, like as Naomi being a widow, she's, lost. She's going to probably die. Like there's, there's hardly any hope for her because she has no way to make money, food, no place to live. Like it's over for her. And so out of grace and mercy, she says to her daughter-in-law, it's like, I love you so much. I want you to leave me. I want you to go get remarried, find love, find security, find a home, have children, like go live out your best life. And don't worry about me. Like there's nothing you can do for me. And so, you know, and I, so I don't, I I think the other two darn laws might get a bad rap, but I don't think that that's a bad thing when you receive grace from someone. They didn't rob Naomi of her blessing. You know what I mean? Like they said, like they, they accepted that. And I think that that, that was a good decision. But then there's Ruth who says, I love you so much. I have grown to love you and, and. And you've been such a part of my life that I won't, I don't want to leave you. I don't, and I don't know, I'm not really a super big biblical scholar, but I would like, and I could be completely wrong, but I'd like to imagine that maybe Ruth being a Moabite, she didn't maybe know all the customs. They didn't know everything about how it was to be like an Israelite or to live like in Jewish culture. I don't know what her background was. But for her to have this, to sacrifice her own life for the sake of someone else, to say, I, I don't know much about what our future is going to look like, but I want to, I want to be there with you. I want to help you. I want to live with you. I want to go where you go. I want to, I want to love what you love. I want to serve your God with you. And I want to support you. And I don't, and our future is so bleak and, and, and scary and unknown and uncertain. And I want to be a part of that with you. I mean, that's a huge commitment and she's giving up a future husband and she's giving up future children for her mother-in-law. And so the reason why I think it can blend so beautifully is, is Mike says to me, like I, five years prior to us ever meeting, I prayed that the woman I would marry would say these words to me and my love letter had like a very eerie, striking resemblance to what Mm -hmm. was written in the Bible. And he said, you're not called to a church. You're not called to be a pastor's wife. You marry me and you become my wife. So it, it really changed my perspective that I'm not going to try and like become something I'm not. I just need to be who I am and let God work through that. And so it's like, 
okay. Like I get that. Like he's, I, I, I can love you. I can do that. Right. I can, I can go where you go. I can, as long as I'm with you, right. They said that cheesy little saying homes, wherever I am with you. Yeah. I mean, that's, that was kind of the truth of it. Like, all right, like I will be a nomad if that's what it takes. I'm choosing to live my life with him, even though our future is unsure and mm-hmm. it looks murky. And I feel like that's kind of what Ruth was saying with Naomi. Like, I'm going to choose to live my life with you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to support you. I'm going to, I'm going to serve God with you. And I'm not going to know what any of this is going to look like, but I'm going to trust you because mm-hmm. I love you. And that trust must have been built, you know, I don't know. So that's, and so when I saw that in the Bible, when he showed me, you have to read this, I immediately, he didn't even have to tell me what he had said to me about how he had prayed. I, I instantly knew and tears started streaming in my face and I knew like, we're supposed to be married. Like, cause God was like saying like, and it was just a comfort to my heart to know, like, I have no idea what this is going to look like for me, but but okay, like I can do this. And then to first, like, again, cause God doesn't leave you there. You know, he continues, he's so gracious. He continues to help your heart get on board with things. B- me being a teacher, I think it was, I had a little boy in my class who had wanted to be, he was, he was one of those little boys that was always naughty, but he didn't want to be. I don't know if you've ever met kids like that. They, he tried so hard to not to, but he couldn't help it. (laughs) The poor thing, like, and my heart was just bent for him. And I just had so much compassion for him. And we had this sweet little relationship. And I, and I would, and uh, his mom had told me like, oh, he told me last night he wants to grow up being a missionary. And I was like, oh, that's a bad thing that you, I know now know that because if I know the thing, now I can use the thing. And so he had gotten into trouble. I don't know exactly what he had done, but it was enough to send him out in the hallway. And I went out to have a talk with him. And I said, buddy, and we were studying the life of David. And he was, David was, had just been anointed in our Bible study that, that morning to be king. And I said, buddy, like, you know, mama tells me you want to be a missionary when you grow up. And he's like, yeah, I do. I so do. I said, that's great. I am so glad that God, you know, wants you to do big things with your life. You remember on our story how David was, um, was anointed and made king, like just this, this morning, he was like, yeah. I said, well, did he become king the next day? And he said, no, no. I said, yeah. Doesn't he become king? Like so when he's like 33 years old, like much, much later, he becomes king. It's because when God wants you to become something, you'll become it the next day because you have to start learning how to obey in the little things so that God can one day trust you with the big things. And all of a sudden I got this like massive like lump in my throat because God wasn't speaking just to my, my student. He was speaking to me. He was saying, Michelle, like I may want you to do this one day, but it doesn't mean that you're going to be it tomorrow. You're not ready tomorrow. You're still young in your faith or young in the, in, in the, in the things that you need to learn, but you need to obey me in the small things and the little things, the little steps you need to, to do one thing at a time. You need to, to protect your sheep and kill the lion and kill the wolf and kill the bear and, you know, help your brothers. You know what I mean? Like whatever David did, those small things to obey one day at a time until he actually did become king one day. And so when I was talking to little boys, like it's not just for me. And, and that has really carried me almost my whole life to know that I'm to be my, my husband's wife first and that I need to obey in the small things, the everyday things. And eventually when, if, and when that day ever comes, I will, I will be ready in God's eyes. I mean, I feel ready, but I'll trust the process. And so I knew, we knew we, this is, this is a God thing. God wants us to be married. And so that's why it was so fast. And, and also my mother made a comment like, girl, if you don't do this now, now that you're engaged, you don't get married and get it done. You're tortured yourself. <laughs> She's like, you just need to get this done and over with. So I was like, good point. Good point. <laughs> Especially if you know, it's supposed to be something of God and you know, you're trying to maintain like a godly relationship. Cause come on, we're human. And so it was just, my mom's like, you need to protect yourself and you go get married. <laughs> so we just were like, why not? Let's just do this all in. Like, let's go. So 
Yeah. So we knew, I mean, that's not everyone's story, but again, I need two by fours and I need to know, like, is this what God wants for me? And, um, cause I think that's my heart. My goal in life is to serve God with my whole heart that I just want to make sure that I'm doing the things in my life that he wants me to do. So, hmm. yeah. So that's how we met. That's why it's so fast when we got engaged and married, but that's I, the truth. I love that story. And I love that picture of David, I think is one of my favorite stories for that, that from when, you know, it was spoken over him, you're going to be king to him actually becoming king was a huge gap of time. It wasn't okay. And tomorrow, right. Right. And the application to all of our lives, whether it's something we know God is bringing us to, or whether we're just being faithful and obedient every day, trusting that this is not a wasted day. Like God will use today, tomorrow. So tell me in this, because now you're in the season of life where your husband is on staff at a church. You, yes. You are the wife of a church ministry leader. You have the three kids, obviously a lot of life, 12 years of marriage. Mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit about first kind of that journey from the, okay, God, I am stepping into this to now I'm in it. Right. Right. Well, like I said, Mike, he wanted to, he wanted to plant a church that was initially on his heart. And so we had decided that where we were at was not helping us get to that goal. Now, you know, once we had gotten married, uh, we had stayed and served in Massachusetts for I think four years after we were married. But I think we both felt like, you know, racehorses when they're behind the gate, they pant and they are excited and they can't wait. And we're just waiting for that gate to just like fly up. Like we were just like antsy. Like we felt like God wanted us to move forward in the next steps of what that would look like for Mike. Um, he had originally thought like I plan a church like cold Turkey just in the way that I am now. But then God was putting his heart like, I think I want to go to seminary. I think I want to go and get some more education. And so we had initially gone down to look at seminary in Pennsylvania. We were there, but I don't, can't explain it. Like we both had this sense on the way back that like now was not the time. I think that was like about three years after we had been married. Like we were just like, I just, I, I, for whatever reason, and we have other stories of God holding us back. It's it's a lot of people always talk about God trying to move you forward, but it's there's it, there's a whole different side to that coin that sometimes God is asking you to hold back, and that's real that that tension is really hard to process as because as you know we live in a culture where like push go drive move forward. It's very very rare to hear people say no sit wait be still, don't move, don't do anything like (laughs) don't move forward on your dreams. So that's that you don't have a lot of books on that (laughs) to be able to work through those types of tensions. But we just felt like God was saying, no, you need to wait, wait a year. We didn't know why, but we just were like, I, we could sense that this is the pieces just weren't falling into place in the right way, even though it was something we really wanted. So we waited a year. And it was exactly what God had for us because I, I really believe that we we are where we are as a result of that that waiting that year of of wait. Um, so we had gone a year a year later, a year since we had checked it out. Uh, we waited a year and then we finally dived in, went to seminary, and so he was in seminary for four years, going for his Master of Divinity, and then which that whole year, four years of my life that transformed me too. Like I think every season of your life does that. Um, especially when you move away from family. And again, I'm an only child. So my mom has had gotten remarried when I was 11, but I feel like I own a lot of the only child like tendencies and uh, mentalities. And so it's like getting to having to move away from all I ever knew. And then you get plopped in like seclusion. (laughs) It's like with no one that, you know, it's real that that'll wake you up. God will use that real big. So we were there for for about I think I don't know it was three years I can't remember I'm, I'm like my kids in school used to call me Miss Forgetfulness so I 
can remember a lot of details, but they're there. <laughs> and so at the end of, uh, at the end of uh, the time when he's done with his credits, you know, we do a year of internship and we didn't know where we were going to be. And most of the time you find out your placement quite soon, like, and we didn't find out till maybe, I don't know, a month or less before we were actually moving to wherever it was. I didn't even know. Wow. I, had, I had my house packed. I'm, I didn't know if I was moving tomorrow, like just waiting to, to go wherever in the country. I have no idea where I'm going to live in like a few weeks. And then Northridge, uh, our church here just said, Hey, like, we want Mike Weston to be like a year long intern. And so we packed up our truck and we moved four hours to upstate New York. And that's where we are now. But that's not just because so a lot, just because we had an internship there. It wasn't like an immediate like job. There was there was life that happened <laughs> in between that. But we so that's how we ended up getting here was North. We were um, interns um, for a year. And then after that, uh, Mike had been putting in lots of applications, you know, and I think that was a really discouraging time for us. Again, it was another period of God telling us to wait, but this time we didn't really, I don't think we really, uh, I don't know, agree is a too hard of a word. We weren't sure that really God, like, like, I guess my husband started to feel a little discouraged that like, if I'm supposed to do this thing, <laughs> like plant a church or whatever. At that point, I think his vision had slightly changed that I would, I want to plant a church, but God may have something different for me. And we were kind of at that point, God had taught us over time that you hold even God's plans loosely. Like when God calls you to something or he, I don't even like the word call. It's more like an assignment. If he gives you an assignment and he says, I want you to do this thing to hold that loosely, that it should guide and direct, but it shouldn't be like a schoolmaster. And so we were thinking, well, let's hold what God has for us with an open hand. At this point, you know, we, we know our heartbeat, but again, God's the one who guides and leads and directs and moves us. So let's just keep praying. Let's keep seeking. But it felt like God was really quiet because Mike had put out a bajillion resumes and hardly any calls back. And Mike was, and we, when graduation from seminary happened, all the professors, you know, we loved them. And they kept saying like, Oh Mike, you're so good at what you do. Like you'll get a job. I just know it. Like someone's going to scoop you up. Like you, you're a gem. You'd be, anyone would be happy to have you. And Mike's like, that's great. But who's scooping me up? <laughs> because I'm not getting scooped. In order, we, and being on internship, we get supplied housing, which is great, but not when new interns come along because then you need to move. <laughs> and so we, at that point, had no job. There was two weeks until we had to move out. Again, my whole house packed up and don't know where I'm going to live. And uh, that was such a, that was definitely stretch our faith that time of our life. And so we were just praying, God, you need to provide a place to live. And we didn't want to move back to Massachusetts at the time because, or New England, because we didn't know if we were going to be, but we didn't want to move. Maybe we thought maybe we could move down to Florida to live with his parents. But like all the pieces didn't make sense because if we move, then we, then what if we get, he gets called tomorrow to move to like Oregon. <laughs> I don't know. Like we felt like God was saying, just stay wait like we were already plugged in at the church we were already serving we were already we already had a community we had f forming friendships so we're like this is life for us here right now so we might as well just stay hunker down pitch tent <laughs> and just see what happens and god ended up providing a place for a house for us to rent like almost a couple more days I had a friend say, oh, so I heard you're looking for a place to live. I have a friend who's renting a house. Like, you should contact them. Okay. And then Mike ended up getting a job at Starbucks. <laughs> because little did you know, you only have to work 20 hours to get full benefits. This is I true. My, I had Liam on Starbucks insurance. <laughs> I did. I knew I liked that kid. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's our coffee baby. You know, and the reason we did, we, we chose Starbucks methodically because... We didn't know if you wanted to plant a church, we might have to be bi bivocational. You know, we, we're, we're going to be honest with the facts we have in front of us. We're not going to just dream and say, oh, he'll get hired and get paid lots of money. That may not be a thing. He right. may get hired and get paid no money. Because that is a thing. <laughs> yeah. So we were thinking, okay, if we get a job 
you know, if he does get hired somewhere, he could be bi vocational because Starbucks, he could be flexible with his hours. He could still get insurance. And we were making it work. Like when you live, when you go to seminary, you have barely like two nickels rubbed together. And so we are already in the, like the, um, rhythm of just, um, living very frugally. That has been like the theme of my life is like how to make things from nothing, how to make food from nothing. So we just continued. Like I told Mike, you know, I can keep doing this. Like it's okay. It's, I know what to do. I know how to live this life. So we'll just keep trusting. But it, God was so silent. Hmm. He was so silent. We were praying. We were like, we're faithful, God. We're, we're serving you. We're doing everything you asked us to do. And I remember saying like, God, like I have given up my whole life for you. Like I have sacrificed in ways that like, I don't necessarily enjoy the whole saying, like some can, well, I cannot. And that, that has also been the theme of my life. How can you just be so silent? How can I didn't, I didn't feel him the way I was used to feeling him, but we just knew, okay, like we just obey. We mm. just do the next right thing. I don't know don't know what that means. The future is so foggy and uncertain. We're just going to the next right thing. Mike knew I need to provide for my family. So I need a job. We need insurance because we got to go to the doctor. We're going to get sick. We have one car. I stayed home because just for the sake of daycare and things cost so much money. And then about six months since we were moving, living at renting that house, that house went up for sale <laughs> and we had to move. <laughs> And so I was like, okay. And at the time I was eight months pregnant with Liam and I was like, all right, God, this is cool. <laughs> so we had to find another place within like not much time. We were trying to find a place that would rent month to month. We couldn't sign a year lease because he had still resumes floating out in the world. We had no idea who would call and when we'd pick up. But we found a place, another place to rent. I don't know, a little like t servant house in the back of the back of another house. So it's kind of like in their backyard, but it had its own drive. It was super cute. It had only um, the upstairs was like a studio. So downstairs was kitchen and living room and bathroom. Upstairs was the bathroom and just one big room with a closet. <laughs> Wow. And how many kids? Three or we two, three, one well, on the way. Two, one on the way. And again, like, I just feel like this is my other saying, God doesn't always give you what you want, but he always gives you what you need. Hmm. And it wouldn't have been something I would have chosen for myself, but it was a roof over my head and it was affordable. It was so affordable with the, and our land, our landlords were like the nicest people. They were Italian. Every Sunday he'd come over with a fresh batch of sauce. I mean, I live there again just for that. <laughs> I will take the studio and the sauce, please. <laughs> yes. So it was not necessarily like what I would have chosen for myself, but there was one of the closets was like a, a dressing closet, had a window and we had a small crib. We were able to make that work as like a little room for, for when the baby would be born. So we had the baby in that, that little studio house. It was the cutest thing. And then literally, so we were only there for three months in that little house because, so Mike had essentially the job at Starbucks for nine months. Then Mike got a call from Northridge and said, Hey, we got a spot for you on the team. Would hmm. you like the job? And I, Mike was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> so that's how initially how we got hired. Um, and they've moved him around. Uh, kind of one of their their sayings is get everyone on the bus and then find the right seat. So yep. get, get the right people on the bus. And so that's what they did. They got him on the bus. And now I wouldn't say that being a director of children's ministries is like exactly the thing that he's always dreamed of. But here's another little facet to how we've learned how God works uh, in our lives is it may not be exactly the thing you want to do, but he has the ability to use the things you love to attain the things he loves. So, so you learn to love what he loves and he uses what you love. Does that make sense? So like what we're good at, our strengths, the way that we can love people and help people and minister people. And, you know, like my husband's really good at assimilation. He's really good at administrative skills. He's really good at keeping his cool, like when things get stressed. And so he can use those strengths to do his job well. And 
I think too, we've learned that what God wants in your life is not like a straight shot. It's not like God says, this is what I want you to do in your life. And like, that's the only thing you're ever going to do. It's like this convoluted, like map of forks and the roads and U-turns and everything's connected and, and it all basically all leads the same place, glorifying God. Like what is like the chief end of man is to glorify God. When we were here at church, we do community groups and we had a young girl in our small group who was engaged to her fiance. And so you just do life with them. You love them. We've had, we had coffee together. Like she helped me with my kids and do laundry and you know, we just gained this really sweet relationship. I felt like she was my sister, you know, like my little sister. Um, when they got married, they invited us to their wedding. And so her fiance's parents had been missionaries to like West Africa. They, he was a professor at a school down there the school closed. And I remember having a conversation with him and he said, you know, like this was my passion. This is what I love to do for God. I thought I was going to die in Africa hmm. and now I'm moving home to Canada and I don't know what to do with my life. And it hit me. Oh my gosh, like we would love to plant churches, but even if we planted a church, that's not the end of our story. Like, why did I think that when we would do what God had wanted us to do and that'd be the end and then the book would close and we'd move on to someone else's story. No, like I told Mike, can you imagine that someday, like the whole church planting thing is like going to be over? Like, and that's not the end. Like there's more. <laughs> so like what it showed me was what God wants me to do in my life. It's not like a one and done deal. Like my life is my life. And he uses every part of that. Um, I was a figure skater for nine years. Um, I was competitive. I wanted to the Olympics. Clearly that did not happen because <laughs> I am not an Olympian. <laughs> so <laughs> that didn't happen. But anyways, um, I remember thinking like I was super passionate when I was in high school, like a super passionate, like it was everything I did. Like I ate it, I drank it, I slept it. Like it was, it was, it permeated like every cell in my body. And then it just wasn't working out. It didn't happen. I couldn't get, I couldn't get to the skill level I needed to be. And I was getting burnt out. And, um, my mom was like, okay, you need to go to college. Like skating's not going to support you, baby. Like you need to find a job. And so I had to just succumb to reality that like, this is not for me. And I just couldn't understand why God would put that desire in my heart. Right. To like love something so much just to not use it. I mean, I gave up friends. I gave up slumber parties. I gave up being cool like, so that I could pursue this dream that would never happen. But here's the thing. God redeems everything, right? When we were here on internship, we had the opportunity to work for Youth for Christ. And one of the areas that they help the inner city kids with is teaching them how to skate. Like they teach them hockey. And so Mike was able to, to preach and to share the gospel and I could teach kids how to skate. It was amazing. And I said, Mike, if I didn't know how to skate, I couldn't do this with you. Like I couldn't help you. I couldn't. So there again, like I'm able to support him and love him by just being me, like, you know, and that, I mean, that really brought me full circle that like, I have the ability to like use all parts of me, all my passions, all my dreams, all my desires. They don't die when they stop. God allow, he uses those skills. He used like, again, he uses the things that you love so that you can love the things he loves. And we love people and we love sharing the gospel. And so it was just amazing. So now he's on staff and I know that again, I mean, yes, we have a law, a larger scope of our lives of, of things that we would love to accomplish and do. But we've also, God has shown us that we need to plant our feet where we are. And that has driven us recently is just, we need to love what's right in front of us. We need to love our children and love our neighbors, like literal neighbors. Like I know that people say, Oh, God says, love your neighbor. And they try to understand all oh, it means everyone like all the people in your life yes I think it's your family it's the people in your church right it's your cousin Joe it's your friend that you see at the gym I get that but I also think it means your literal neighbors <laughs> like the people across the street from you you know the people that you live and breathe in and so when we eventually were able to buy a house purchase a house we were very strategic in buying a house in an area that we could love people well. 
not only do we want, we have dreams and desires that God has put in our heart. We also know that God has put us right here, right now. And you can't get lost in those dreams. You can't get lost in the the future and the what if you need to, again, be obedient in what God has given you right now. And God will shine those small bits of light as you slowly walk toward him, like it will happen. Like, again, like one of the things I'm learning recently is I'm not responsible for the fruit. Like I just abide there. The only action we're required to take is abide. We're supposed to just abide in God. And I'm like, I can abide. It's easy, right? Like I can abide in Jesus. I can, I can have a conversation with him. I can love him. I can love people that he puts in my path and be with him. And I can, I can do that. But then it says that, He's the one who's responsible for that fruit, not me. Hmm. I'm not responsible to save people. I'm not responsible to change their life. I'm not responsible to make a difference. Like I'm just supposed to obey and abide. And Hmm. so that has been life changing for us. And I honestly can say, I think I've felt the closest to God as a result. And we've seen God move in bigger ways when we've stopped getting in the way. (laughs) And just letting him do what he does. (laughs) Yeah. And I love that. Um, This has kind of been a theme in a lot of conversations lately, but just that daily obedience, the abiding. It's funny you said early on about, you know, nobody writes the book about when, you know, God holds you back or he's like, okay, stop, pause. But then I was thinking, well, I guess he wrote John 15. <laughs> he wrote and said, Abide. Yeah, there you go. Like, I, yeah that's a great any, connection. <laughs> if anybody wrote, it was God himself that said, listen, really first things first, like rest in me, abide in me, be present and let me lead. And I love just the reminder that our journeys are not a straight shot. It's not a okay, here's the end. And it's just going to be this one long string, but just looking at your, how many times it was, okay, we're moving forward. Okay. Now we got to move again. Okay. We're changing over here. And to me, I look at those things as each time what God was strengthening was your connection to him. Like it's pushing you into prayer, it's pushing you into God. Oh my word. Where are you? I don't feel you. And you even said it yourself. I don't want my heart to get in the way of my head. And then as you're telling your story, I was like, wow, it's really interesting how God took your heart right out of it and was like, okay, well then we're going to put that, we're going to strengthen that by taking all of the, you know, you're not going to feel my presence, but you're, you're going to know that I'm there and I'm Wow, Even if that's it's that's just deep in stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a true story. No, but it's true. Yeah. And I, and I really think, you know, with, through the, coming to the end of that silent period where God was quiet in our lives, um, the end conclusion God kept telling me over and over again was, um, I am God, you are not. Yeah. Like when he finally started to speak, when I finally started to hear him in his word, I am God, you are not. And that was, and I was like, okay, that's enough for me. Like, I'm not God and I don't, I need to just surrender to mm-hmm. this what in, and it's not fun. And I, and I don't have big stories to tell my 10 year reunion about like how successful I've been. I just know like, no, I'm just trying to do the right thing right now. Yeah. Um, and just hope it works out. Cause he says it, he says it will. <laughs> and I don't think it's by accident, the way the word says it, God's word is be still and know that I am God, not be still and feel that I am God. And That's in true, those yeah. moments of just of knowing, well, honestly, in your story, you answered most of the questions that oh, I would really? ask, which I love, like <laughs> just knowing this season of life and how God has really called you to be present and reach your neighbors. And I could probably ask a million questions in regard to that. But for the sake of time, I'm actually going to, I'm going to fast forward us somewhat to the end because okay. First of all, you've covered some incredible things. I have a lot of notes and a lot of things to to process, and I love that. Um, but what I'm really wondering after all of this, what is actually the most superficial thing about you? It's so hard Let's to just choose. get to the real deal yes, here. Yes. 
Oh gosh, there's so much. I guess the first thing that comes to my mind is I'm like major girly girl. I think one of the things that I've had the hardest time with through my whole journey is like not having the money to like go get my eyebrows waxed or to like, oh, the girls get all these beautiful lash extensions. And I'm like, gosh, I can't even make mac and cheese. Like, I'm not, I don't have enough money to buy the elbow macaroni, you know? So, and like, I'm wearing a hat, you, you know, your listeners can't can't see I'm wearing a hat because I am like weeks behind on my hair coloring <laughs> and I have so many grays I'm I swear people don't think I do but it's because I color my hair and you don't know they're there <laughs> so I think like just my I'm I can be very vain and I and I, again God has worked with that as well <laughs> and just realizing that you know what like it's like I heard someone say it we're not put on this earth to be pretty <laughs> That's my purpose. So God's work that, but I would say that me just trying to always like my vanity, like just, I, that sounds so awful, but it's true. No, it really doesn't. It's, I think it's very relatable. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the hair coloring, I do. So do you want to feel better about this is at one point I saved up enough money and a friend of mine gave me this really good deal on doing lash extensions. Yes. Yeah. Of course, because I'm not girly girl. To me, I look at that and I'm like, that seems so low maintenance. Like you wake well, up yes, yes. and you're like, bam. It's like, it's like twofold. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Look at yeah. these eyes. I had yeah. to do no work. Okay. So here's the thing. I will say I loved them. They were as easy as I thought they would be. However, because I'm not girly and I like mess with my eyes too much. Oh, I you found, them off. Well, no, but I found <laughs> they actually got increasingly irritating in my eyes where like they oh. were actually bothering my, like I could feel them on, not oh, when they wow. were first done, but as time went on. And so when I first had them done, I was like, I'm definitely getting these like refilled. And then after a couple weeks, I'm like, I can't handle this. <laughs> these are driving me crazy. Of course, now in like retrospect, which it always seems better when you look back, I'm like, oh, my eyes were so much like better and my eyelashes are so pretty. I should have really just sucked it up and kept sucked going it with it. Well, this has been wonderful. I feel the need to tell you, you know what? If you find yourself in an elbow macaroni kind of season of life, I have a mean method of making ramen noodle <laughs> that my daughter swears by. You'll so have to send me the recipe. If you, if you have a lack of sodium in your life. <laughs> <laughs> Which my kids definitely do. Definitely. Oh, well then one package of macaroni is like a lifetime's supply of sodium. So <laughs> it's true. It's really true. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for giving us part of your day. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, it was, it was good to talk with you too. Thanks so much. Okay, that was Michelle, which loved, love, love getting to chat with her. But Laurie, what did you think of her? Michelle needs to be my mentor because her love story with her husband, it just felt like an episode of The Notebook. Well, The Notebook was a movie, so I guess just the whole thing. But Michelle quoted the Ruth story, and I loved how she walked that slowly through with our listeners and how she was choosing a life with her husband. And she didn't have all the right answers, but she knew that no matter what, she wanted to go that direction. And what really was just like, oh, I, it, it hit my heart really hard was she wants to fan the flame that God put in his heart. And it made me think, am I fanning the flame in my husband's heart? Am I fanning the flame in my friend's heart? And sometimes I'm just so concerned with my own heart and what's going on with me. And I don't think that I'm doing that today. So she needs to be my mentor to kind of help me be a better wife, a better friend, and make sure that I'm encouraging others to continue to follow God and not worrying about all the little things that get into the day type of thing. She can fan the flame in your heart. She totally did. It was like a gust of wind that was like, ah. Oh. I love it. I also enjoyed that. And I'm always super convicted 
because I feel like my husband's really good at that towards me. This podcast is basically an example of that. This would not exist without him fanning this flame of, girl, you need to do this. And then spending hours like editing it. It's crazy. But then I flip the script on myself and I'm like, do I do that enough for him? Like, because yeah, it's really easy to get caught up in your own heart and your own dreams and the danger in that, at least for me, is if I feel like someone's not acknowledging my, like, it's almost like we all are out for our own instead of looking out for the needs of others. Hmm. I feel like there's scripture that could back that up. (laughs) Um, but just that idea of what would it look like if we all started spending a little less time worrying about our own hopes and dreams, not that we totally ditched them, but looking to others and being like, how can I encourage this person and who God's made them, what he's called them to be? I, I just love that picture. And it's not even just fanning the flame in one way. So I'll think to myself, oh, Jared, my husband has been watching TV for hours. I should go over and tell him, Jared, read your Bible or let's do a little study together. And that's not fanning his flame. That's smothering his flame. And so each person, you have to think about what will encourage them to take a step or kind of respect them in the way that they need to hear the gospel. It's kind of the difference between we want to fan the flame, like the Holy Spirit in them. We don't want to be the flame. Yes. <laughs> we are Amen not the flame. <laughs> yes. So I'm uh, still newer in my marriage, so I definitely have some things to learn. So Michelle, thank you so much for pointing that out. I love it. And even outside of marriage, honestly, in our friendships, mm-hmm. that should be a reality. I Actually, the times in my life where people have called things out on me, not in even like a rebuking way, but in a positive way, like, did you know this about yourself? There have been times where people have spoken encouraging words over me of things I didn't even notice, I guess, or recognize in myself that this is something that God was doing. And it's really shaped and changed who I am. And I want to be that person to other people. I want to be the one that looks at someone and is like, hey, do you know that you totally have this gift that God's given you? And whether it's you light up a room or you just have so much wisdom or whatever it is, I absolutely love it. I have another aha from Michelle. Let's hear it. This was something that has been a theme for me lately, and I keep clearly needing to hear it over and over because it keeps coming up. But this idea of doing the next right thing, of small obedience just one day at a time, that's pretty much my life right now. And it's this almost frustrating place of not being able to see that far ahead and know like, okay, what's five years from now? Heck, what's like five days from now? I don't know. But I do know that God has me in this really frustrating and hard, ugly growth place of, I just want you to do the next right thing, the thing I've placed right in front of you. And Michelle talked about that. And if you don't follow her on Instagram, definitely do it because her life, even beyond what she talked about, she has this journey, even in her own health, of that being a theme in her life of taking steps towards taking care of herself and getting into shape and how that was not this instantaneous, like one day I'm this and the next day, whatever, but just one day at a time, choosing those, choosing obedience, doing the next right thing and kind of seeing over time how God uses that to change her and how he can use that in my life to change me. That was my big, like, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, she mentioned having the forks in the road, and it's not always sure which one you should go down, but at the end of the day, if you keep abiding in God and obeying God, the forks aren't going to matter. You're going to end up at the same place. I don't remember what blog I read it on, and I feel bad because I could have advertised somebody's blog, but someone was talking about this idea of how we focus so much on what is God's call in my life, like, because we talk about that in Christian circles, in the church, and they made this really powerful point that God's call on every believer is to follow him. And if we keep our eye on that versus the specifics of what that might look like, 
then we can worry and spend so much less time being anxious about, is this the right decision? Like, should I go here? Should I do this? And just focus on, I'm my call is to follow Jesus. And that could change day by day. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, I just need to keep stepping in obedience every time he shows me what to do next and not worry about, okay, is this decision, what's this going to do to 10 years from now or whatever it is? Like, just keep following, being faithful every single day. Yeah. I think, ladies, we need to keep our eye on the prize. We need to think about how to fan the flame in others, how to just continue our walks step by step and michelle talked about all of those and more so we love you michelle we're so grateful that you came on and shared and challenged us today and listeners as always we want to encourage you to just keep on running your race in your place do the next right thing and keep being awesome for jesus bye girls